Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Monday live stream. So we have a lot of things to cover, so let's just jump right in. So today is the thumbnail and title suggest. It looks like uh, Gary Gensler and SEC are on the warpath yet again as they decided to sue Robinhood, which is not surprising because they uh, love to do that. And as a reminder, uh, congratulations to all uh, the American citizens who dutifully pay their taxes so that Gary Gensler can protect you harder and go against the centralized exchanges uh, for which you would like to actually transact and go against them and to hinder your progress, which again, uh, it's a great thing of, of the SEC. If, even if they lose, they still win. Anyhow, this is what we have for today. I found it interesting that uh, we're still hovering around 2.4 uh, trillion market cap, uh, Bitcoin last 24 hours down a little bit. I think we're going to see a little bit of uh, more price action, especially as this news starts to unfold about what the SEC actually wants to do. I did find something quite, uh, I wouldn't say it's interesting, concerning, is that as far as largest gainers, uh, you got Celsius Network is up 12%. When I took a look at this, I'm like, what in the heck is going on with this? This is another, of course, Celsius Network token for Celsius. Of course, that was a Ponzi scheme as time went on. It actually did work for a while, but then it was a Ponzi scheme. But over seven days, a month, three months, I don't know what's going on, but I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. It's up to you to decide what you want to do, but I think that's worthless. And it's just people who, again, are speculating the same thing happened with the FTT token from FTX. Anyhow, let's move on to the day's story. Robinhood. Now, I use Robinhood, and I actually... Uh, fine exchange, uh, you know, for traditional equities. I do not use it uh, exactly for crypto and digital assets. I use mostly Coinbase in that regard. But this is what we have today. Robinhood stock dives at the receipt of SEC Wells Notice, which is disclosed. Now, I don't know what uh, the price of Robinhood is doing right now. It could be up, could be down. Again, expect volatility. It's going to be all over the place. This is what happened. The Wells Notice was received on the 4th of May. Uh, following a previously disclosed SEC investigation into Robinhood's crypto listings, custody of cryptocurrencies, and platform operations. So it's not on the security side of what they actually do. It's on the crypto side. And they're saying that the cryptos, even though on that platform they sell securities, a lot of your trade securities, which are traditional equities and stocks and things like that, they're saying that also the crypto there is not registered as cryptos or excuse me, as securities. So they're asking them, why do they do that? And of course, that's what they're gonna sue. Wells Notice states that the SEC staff decided to recommend the SEC file an enforcement action against Robinhood, alleging securities violations. The potential action may involve a civil, civil injunction action, public administrative proceedings, and or a cease and desist proceeding, and may seek remedies that include an injunction, cease and desist order, disgorgement, prejudgment interest, civil money penalties, censure, revocation, and limitations on activities. What they're saying is essentially is that they're going to shut down Robinhood for crypto. Unless Robinhood really wants to go against the SEC, which they might, uh, they're pretty much saying like, look, stop right now and don't do anything. And then you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's a pretty easy thing to do. Why don't you just go into the office of Gary Gensler and ask them, hey man, what do you need? We can do it. We've already done this on the security side. We already do things with stocks, why can't we do the same thing with crypto? Tell us what we need to do. Interesting question. And that was actually stated by Dan Gallagher, Robinhood's chief legal and compliance officer. And he said, look, after years of good faith attempts to work with the SEC for regulatory clarity, including our well-known attempt to come in and register, we are disappointed the agency has decided to issue a Wells notice, even though we've gone in and asked to work with them. We firmly believe that the assets listed on our platform are not securities, and we look forward to engaging with the SEC to make clear just how weak any case against Robinhood Crypto would be on both the facts and the law. So again, it's another, it's another example of the SEC. This is uh, enforcement through regulation. They're going to come at all these different places and go, this is security, this is security, security. Come in and talk to us. We try to do that. We don't care. Even though we're not going to give you guidance, we're still going to shut you down. And again, this is essentially where we're at. This is Operation Choke Point 2.5, 3.0, whatever you want to call it. And that's just how it is. So let me just think about that in the comments section. Before we move on to the uh, Cardano and Bitcoin Cash interesting piece, I would just say this. I said this a long time ago, and I stand by this. The SECs are bullies, and there's only one way to deal with bullies. You can't appease them. You can't talk them down. You can't say, okay, we're going we're gonna to collude together. 
You have to punch them in the mouth. And the only way that we're going to get past this is for essentially all these organizations to come together and sue the SEC. Go talk to Kraken and how they actually did it. They tried to appease them and come through with them after they got sued and go, okay, look, we won't do any staking. They shut everything down. And what happened? They sued them again and they sued them again. And they, people are just going to be, I don't know, like, I think I'm talking to myself. Anyhow, let me just think about that in, in the last piece. Let's move on to some positive stuff, shall we? Cardano. Now, look, whether you hate Cardano or love Cardano, usually there's nobody in the middle. I think this is a good, a good move by uh, Charles Hoskinson, the head of the foundation, and just asking a very simple question. Would you like to see Bitcoin Cash become a Cardano partner chain? Which is what they're doing with Midnight, I believe. Correct me in the comment section. Upgraded with useful proof of work, Ni Pao Pao's proof of works and Ergo Tech, thus becoming the fastest and most useful proof of work chain ever built. And so far with almost 15, let's just refresh this. Maybe it's, maybe it's there. Yeah. Now with almost 15,000 votes, 68% are saying yes. And I got to tell you, this is a step in the right direction. This is where I think all the platforms should really go to. It's either chain abstraction or it's multi-chain. Chain abstraction means you don't really know what's going on underneath the hood, which is when the internet took off. Before the internet took off, you had to like do a bunch of dial up, maybe you had to do a little bit of HTML to kind of make things work. That was very early days. I'm old, I remember these things. But as time has gone on, you know, it's just go to the internet, right? It's the same thing with crypto. There's no reason why we should have to go through all these different chains and pay all these different feeds and do all this bridging. The normies aren't gonna, aren't gonna go for that. So I applaud this decision. I know some people hate it, but for me, I'm like, this is good. And as a reminder, World Mobile Token, which I'm an Earth Node operator, uh, one of their big projects that are on the Cardano blockchain, they went multi-chain a long time ago. On the 3rd of August, 2023, World Mobile announced the creation of dedicated cross-chain bridges to both BNB and Ethereum. The deployments will write a secure and convenient way for users to move World Mobile Token between Cardano, BNB chain, and Ethereum. And then also today, uh, Jupiter Exchange, which is, a, which is a, basically a Solana exchange, which is the DEX, they came out and said, look, we're going to use Clone Protocol, and you're going to be able to trade assets that aren't native on Solana, such as Doge, Arbitrum, and Optimism, seamlessly with low fees and without needing to bridge. That's huge. Now, on this one, it's a little bit different because the Clone Protocol, it's not the actual perfect asset per se on the chain. It's just a one-to-one -one, uh, synthetic, essentially. So, I mean, it's a step in the right direction. But, I mean, I just think that everything is going to be multi-chain, it's going to be chain abstraction, and that's where we should really go. But let me know how, how you see it. That's how I see it. Also, another bit of piece of news. I want to say congratulations to whoever this diamond hand legend is. Somebody who had was holding Bitcoin for 10 plus years just moved it. I don't know if you have that kind of conviction, but I'm going to show you the kind of money or value that came out of this. So Satoshi era, era dominant dormant Bitcoin address wakes up over 10 years. Here's what we got. It's very simple. The Bitcoin wallet contains 687 Bitcoin. In today's price, that's 40 3.99. Let me say that again. This person bought Bitcoin roughly 10 years ago, around 2014. And today it's worth 43.9 million. They transferred its holdings to two different wallets on May 6th. I think that's pretty much it. I just wanted to say that uh, for this, when I was thinking about it, I'm like, okay, 10 years ago, what was the price of Bitcoin back then? And I went to 99bitcoins.com, which is probably the best place to get historical uh, price points. So if we're going 10, 10 years back, and this is of course not perfect, this could be the 11, 10 and a half, 11 years, but let's just say it was May, May 6th of 2014. Bitcoin was $428. And I can guarantee you back, I wasn't, or I wasn't into Bitcoin back then. I wasn't into crypto at all back then. But I can guarantee you that people were probably calling this person a moron because not too long ago, it was over a thousand bucks. And this moron, not, not what I'm probably his friends, were saying, don't buy that. It's 40%, almost 50, it's like way down, 60% plus. What are you doing? Why are you buying Bitcoin? That's so dumb. Nerd money, nerd. 
And of course, they stuck around for 10 years and made $44 million. <laughs> so I like these. So congratulations to whoever that person was. I don't know if I could hold it for 10 years. I like to take profits along the way. That's why I have the rules. Anyhow. And then lastly, uh, another worthless price prediction. I'm, I, I do like these because it allows us to dream. I, I give people a lot of guff about it, about uh, price action and you know price predictions, but it does allow us to kind of like step outside our, you know, our zone and say, well, it could actually be this and everybody gets happy about it. So I'm not saying this is what's gonna happen. My price prediction goes from this. Bitcoin by the end of 2024 will be somewhere between the price of $5 and $500,000. Somewhere in that range, I'm pretty sure Bitcoin will hit it. But uh, Bernstein analysts say it's 150,000. End of this year. Here's what we have. And actually, it does make sense. So Grayscale's, they say this is why they think it's going to go to 150,000 by the end of the year. Grayscale's converted Grayscale Bitcoin ETF recorded 63 million in net inflows on Friday after a 78-day streak of outflows. Now, if you're unfamiliar, uh, the Bitcoin ETF uh, has been going gangbusters for quite some time. Last week kind of slowed down, but all of a sudden we had Grayscale, which was doing all the dumping, had 63 million in net inflows. And this got everybody excited. And that was why there was a reversal of price action, which makes me very happy. So like, well, that's what's going on. And that could continue. We like to see that. But then also they said, there's also strong overall inflows in ETF over the past three months. New encouragement for corporate treasuries to buy Bitcoin. There's also rumblings of nation states and sovereign funds getting into the Bitcoin uh, of the ETF. And we're gonna see that in different tax filings uh, as that comes out, we'll see. Study post having hash rate, healthy post having transaction fees and subdued prices for Bitcoin mining equipment. So I always like to take to double check people on what they're talking about. And you can do this too. Uh, over, I just stole this from Ben's site. Into the cryptoverse, this is the uh, hash rate. And we can just see that hash rate we're, over time. Let me, let me zoom out. <laughs> Look at that hash rate. This is the computational power that's actually needed for Bitcoin to actually mine a block, right? And over time, look at, geez, look at that. It was nothing back in the day. And over time, April 21, things went, you can see that the hash rate which there's a lot of Bitcoin miners, a lot of corporations, a lot of entities who believe in this and are buying Bitcoin mining rings and, and setting them up all over the planet. And you can see that we're at not an all time high, but doing pretty good. Also, there's this thing called the difficulty chart. Now, as more miners get into uh, the Bitcoin network, the difficulty actually goes up. And we just see that the, bit, the, 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 the difficulty chart can say that we're actually at an all-time high for difficulty. Now this gets adjusted every two weeks. Don't think it just keeps going up. At some point, some Bitcoin miners are going to capitulate. They're going to shut off the rigs. Difficulty is going to go down. The people that were actually saving for a rainy day or the corporations that actually all these Bitcoin mining companies are going to say, hey, great, you guys stopped. We're going to take it from here and uh, generate a bunch of revenue because we're going to do for transaction fees and Bitcoin mining. But you can see that the difficulty, it's all-time high. We just had our are uh, having not too long ago, actually April 20th, right? April 20th, no, April 19th. So that's been two weeks and we're still going strong. Huh? I stand corrected. I thought people would be shutting off, but I guess not. And if we take a look, if we zoom out, we can see just how difficult it's actually been over time. And then like, no, not slowing down. Now, as far as fees, I gotta tell you, uh, because of the runes protocol, actually more, mostly ordinals, ordinals, on Bitcoin are essentially NFTs on the Bitcoin blockchain. Runes are essentially tokens or meme coins on the Bitcoin blockchain on the layer, not a, not a layer two. And we can see that it's on the 20th itself, the average transaction fee for Bitcoin was $127. And over here in red is Ethereum at two bucks, actually almost three. And now if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that the price has gone up, but not too much, but it's, it is always weird to me to see that the Bitcoin transaction fee is higher than the Ethereum transaction fee. Makes me wonder what's going on with Ethereum. Anyhow, that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. 